Thank you. Hopefully you can all hear me. Yeah, okay. Very nice to see you all and welcome to this session on the evolution of reverse mentoring. My name is Emily Cosgrove from the Conversation Space and I'm talking here today with Mark Taylor uh, from RSM UK and uh, well, it's really lovely to be able to bring two voices in to share our story about um, how reverse mentoring has been introduced, evolved, embedded, tailored at RSM. And um, I'm really delighted because Mark is able to share uh, his internal perspective as a stakeholder and also as a reverse mentee on the experience of, uh, of being part of that and of growing this exciting um, initiative. Um, so I am co-founder of The Conversation Space. We are interested in strengthening human connection through the power of conversation. Uh, and I know that well, I've been talking to some of you and I know that there's been quite a, a lot of focus on AI uh, at the exhibition and the conference. And we were just talking before about this room is all about human centered approach to learning. So um, it might be different from some of the sessions you've been in before. And I know that the panel conversation has just been around curiosity. So there's a really nice link there between what we're going to be talking about and some of the other themes of the conference. Um, just to give a tiny bit of background, uh, Mark and I for seven years now have been looking at reverse mentoring at RSM. Um, and mentoring itself I am sure you will all be familiar with, maybe some of you are familiar with reverse mentoring too, but it's about flipping the idea of classic uh, learning through experience gap between a mentee and a mentor on its head and having somebody probably more junior within an organization being the mentor and the mentee being more senior. <coughs> but let me share with you what we're going to talk about today. For those of you who like to know what's coming, um, the reverse mentoring at RSM started out looking at, uh, from an intergenerational perspective, so looking at creating pairs across different generations, uh, and Mark is going to share perspectives on that. We're going to look at the, at the kind of broader power and opportunity of reverse mentoring. And we're going to share with you some insights around how it happened and maybe share some ideas around if you're interested in looking at reverse mentoring in your own organizations, what kind of things you can get hold of and what are the important factors to think about some of the challenges um, and the impact of reverse mentoring as well. We also have here creating brave space in conversations and that's one of the key elements really of um, the power of reverse mentoring is that it sets up the opportunity to have more curious and courageous conversations with somebody who hopefully is different from ourselves in some way. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to leave some time at the end to have a conversation with you as well. We'd love to hear your questions and hopefully be able to answer them. But I thought maybe we would start out um, by just taking a look around in the room. If reverse mentoring is around having conversations across difference, I thought, let's see who's in the room and what differences do you notice? Have a look. I'd be interested to hear. What are the differences that you see in the room between you and the other people? Are there any? Age, yeah, age for a start. I mean, the obvious things, what do we notice? Gender, age, gender, ethnicity, race. These are the things that we talk about in reverse mentoring, hopefully, and where the learning comes. So rather than despite our differences, the learning is because of our differences. And that can feel a little bit difficult sometimes or challenging to talk about. So, 
hence brave space and where we will be getting to through this conversation. But before I hand over to Mark, I'm going to ask one more thing, because we are looking particularly in the context of age at work. And I wonder how many of you work every day, every week with somebody of a gener different generation to yourselves? Yeah, almost everyone. Does anybody not work with someone of a different generation to themselves? OK, so you all do. Anyone work with people of two different generations to yourself? Yeah? Still quite a few. Three different generations to yourselves? Yeah, a few of you still. OK. Apparently, there are now five generations at work in the workplace, from um, boomers all the way through to Gen Zs now. And it's in this context of intergenerational conversations and work context that I'm going to hand over to Mark uh, to talk a little bit about why that was the focus for the reverse mentoring at RSM as a start point. So thanks, Mark. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Mark Taylor. Uh, and as Emily said, we've been on this journey now since 2017. Uh, if you don't know the organization that I work for, RSM, we're an audit, tax, and consulting business. We're one of the top 10 accountancy firms in the UK. Uh, today, we turn over about 500 million. There are about 5,000 people in the organization. Going back to 2017, the organization was a bit smaller, about 300 and 350 million and 3,500 people. Okay, so that's, the, that's the kind of scale of, of what we are. Um, so you probably conjure images of traditional, hierarchical, conservative kind of organization, and you probably wouldn't be a, a million miles away. Okay, um, 2017, uh, we had a regional managing partners conference in the, in the north, uh, and we had a speaker called Dr. Eliza Philby. I don't know if any of you come across Eliza Philby. She is a visiting lecturer here at King's College in London, and she is an expert on intergenerational intelligence. And um, she gave us a really interesting talk about millennials in the workplace. Uh, at that time, you know, millennials, more and more of them were getting more and more senior roles in, in our business. And we're starting to think about millennials and their, and their role in the workplace and their attitudes. And were they different to previous generations? And one or two things that she said really stuck in my mind that day. She got a really nice mnemonic for, for describing differences or similarities between um, uh, millennials and previous generations. And that mnemonic is selfie. Um, and, and that stands for satisfaction, ethics, leadership, flexibility, individualism, and education. And in those areas, uh, Eliza had observations to make in terms of how millennials see the word world versus previous generations. She also rather amusingly said that, you know, it's, it's true through the history of time that every generation thinks that the one that follows them is lazier and more feckless. Hi. The selfie... Uh, Satisfaction, ethics, leadership, flexibility, individualism, and education. Okay, um, and I, th I thought that was really that was a really interesting uh, kind of presentation that she gave us. And I already knew Emily and Sarah from the conversation space. We'd been we'd had a relationship for a little while then, and I became aware of work that that. Sarah and Emily had already done with one of our larger competitors in this area and we got into a conversation about reverse mentoring and I thought it was a really interesting, it was a really interesting combination there because I came away from that, from Eliza Philby's presentation thinking, okay, millennials are increasingly important to us, um, how do we explore how they really feel about, well the millennials we've got in our organisation, how they feel about work, about career, about, um, about their paths, how can we get under the skin of that? And that's where the, the conversation started about how we might deploy reverse mentoring. Um, and the following year then, in 2018, we ran our first pilot. We decided that we would take a group of millennials within our business in the Birmingham office, which I was responsible for um, at that time. We would take um, eight mentors who were all under 30. That was the common feature. So they're all millennials. And eight mentees who were all partners in the business. Uh, and that is, that is where we began, and we've gone on to run a number of iterations of reverse mentoring since. I'll, I'll stop and go back to Emily in just, just a second. But the whole premise of that was that we believed that through this new conversation, we could create new relationships that would 
give a different perspective on culture within our organization um, and result in more, engra more engagement and, and better inspiration within the business. That was our whole ethos in terms of a starting point. Emily? Thank you. Mark. Thank you. Um, so the power of reverse mentoring. Uh, just out of interest uh, of those of you here, um, who maybe has been involved in any kind of mentoring, either as a mentor, as a mentee, as a, a programmer, yeah, almost all of you, it looks like, and involved in reverse mentoring particularly? No, okay, yeah, a couple, two, maybe, 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 maybe. Yeah, thank you, three or four people. Um, so mentoring as, uh, as an idea, as a concept, is about, well, mentoring is a relationship. It's not an activity. It is about getting to know another human being, another person at work. It's about beginning, creating, growing, and learning from that relationship with that other person. And particularly, what's powerful about mentoring is the gap. And in traditional mentoring, that's, that's around experience, the, the experience of Korea, or in this particular organization. The power of reverse mentoring is that we're flipping that round, usually within a classic hierarchy. So Mark mentioned that uh, it was the partners in the Birmingham office and people who were just starting out in their career uh, in their 20s. And there's all sorts of opportunities and also challenges when we flip the power within a power hierarchy, within that kind of structure. Um, and the opportunities are great and the risks are greater when we do that as well. But really the value of reverse mentoring is about that dynamic, that change around, and uh, the kind of the juice that we can find in there. So to share a little bit about the history of reverse mentoring, the first time that I can find, and, and please tell me if anyone else has found anything further back than this, was in the 1990s, um, a man called Jack Welsh, who at that point was CEO of General Electric in the States. And this is just as kind of the internet was arriving and technology was starting to really kind of grow and blossom. And he identified a lack of tech skills in his senior leaders. And he thought, well, why not use the young people in our organizations, those people who are much more familiar or, or much quicker to learn and have a better understanding of this new technology, why don't we create um, a learning opportunity by pairing them up, matching them up with our senior leaders to help those senior leaders learn about this new tech stuff? So that was kind of where it started. And the learning was particularly focused on gaining skills in technology. And it was great. It worked really well. It was really powerful. And he, he kind of spoke about it all over the place and grew, interest grew in reverse mentoring. And still reverse mentoring now is used to help people pick up kind of social media skills, whether it's around TikTok or, or Snapchat or whatever it might be, more senior, older people wanting to use um, younger people in the organization to help them understand it, the digital, um, that kind of digital learning. But we think that there is a trick that is missed when the learning stays at that level. Because actually, when we are looking at mentoring and reverse mentoring as a relationship, the learning opportunity is much greater. Because in comes all of the stuff around leadership skills, mindset, behavior, interpersonal interactions, um, and a lot of the reverse mentoring that we are now involved in at the conversation space is specifically in the diversity, equity, inclusion area within organizations. So we're working at the moment, for example, with the British Library 
um, and their reverse mentoring program, which is particularly focused on race to support their race equality action plan there. Because it is about two people coming together who have difference and talking and understanding that difference. And by doing so and growing a relationship where we trust each other, we're able to um, step into more challenging and difficult conversations and learn from each other's lived experience. So reverse mentoring offers far more than just technical skills or whatever else it may be at the surface level. It really offers the opportunity to get to know another person and from that experience then make different decisions and change culture and create different systems and processes in our organizations which can help inclusion, which can help foster a different culture and engagement. So reverse mentoring offers far more than it appears at the surface. It really feeds into busting assumptions, learning about difference, working within diversity. And I'm going to hand back over to Mark to share his experience of being involved in that. So, um, so RSM is, I think I would say culturally, we've got a very supportive, very, a very team, uh, very teamwork focused culture and it's, it's a great place to work. I wouldn't have given it 20 years of my career if it wasn't and that's where I'm at. Um, but I think looking back, culturally I didn't feel uh, at the point we started this that we, we were great at listening down through the organisation. Listening to what people more junior within the business had to say and their observations. And I find myself looking down and thinking well after Eliza Philby spoke, what, what do these millennials think about work? How, how many of them really want the career, some of the traditional career paths that we've had where people have joined at 22 or 18 and, and spent their entire career in the accounts profession? If fewer and fewer of them are going to be doing that, then how do we respond to it? So in, in embarking upon this journey, I felt that reverse mentoring could be a really effective tool for us to send a really positive cultural message to the organization that we wanted to listen and we wanted to respond. Um, and and that's, where we, that's where we began, really, in terms of, um, in terms of a, an overall ethos for why we wanted to do this. Um, and, of course, really interested to hear what people had to say. As a, as a managing partner, um, I was also concerned that there could be things going on in my office. There could be streams of issues that were, were present that I just wasn't aware of. And actually, I felt through reverse mention we could explore that. And, and what developed, actually, whilst there were eight mentors from across the business, actually what happened in practice was you got a hub and spoke type effect because each mentor would speak to their peer group and they would feed in their perspectives and their viewpoints that they wanted sharing with leadership. And this all fitted quite neatly with, actually, RSM's tagline is the power of being understood. And so it fitted really nicely from a curiosity perspective in terms of in terms of that message within the business. Now, you know, one of the questions you might be thinking and wondering about is, well, okay, that's all good, but what about benefits that the organization has seen as a result of doing this? How do you measure it? Because a lot of this is quite intangible. We have had some, re some very real practical outcomes from the program, which have been very positive for the business in terms of things that have changed. So, and one of those that I'd, I would point to, one of the biggest things that I'd point to is as a result of one of the ideas that came from the first group that ran, we implemented a shadow board within the business, an uh, initi initiative that we call Talk to the Top. So a group of um, each, each sort of couple of years, we elect a new group of junior people from within the business who are they're elected by their peers to sit on a shadow board and meet with the leadership of the firm every couple of months to debate and discuss key issues that are facing the business. Um, and that, so we, we, we often point to that as a key, a key success that came out of running reverse mentoring. But we've done lots of other things as well, lots of other ideas about helping, helping junior people to have confidence in networking and to get involved in business development earlier in their careers. We changed some of the ways that we approach recruitment, how we interact with sixth formers and how we interact with uh, graduates as a result of feedback that we got from the programme. 
Uh, and, and post pandemic, we also use reverse mentoring as a way of exploring how best we could re-implement social activity within the business. What did people want from that now? Did it still look and feel like it did in 2018, 2019? Or did people want something different from social interaction within the business? So um, that's been great in terms of actually getting ideas from throughout the business to, to take forward. And we've run a number of programs now. We've had three in Birmingham. The first one was focused on millennials, under 30s. But actually, since the first iteration, we changed the scope of it so that it could be any junior person below the manager grade. So that brought in, another, that brought in some, some other people, older people who, who's, um, who were still below the manager grade. And that gave us different perspectives. That brought in a whole lot of administration people who support the business, because tapping into their perspectives is also really important to us. Um, and then it's gone on and be run in several other locations around the country. And more recently, we had a cohort run uh, where our board specifically targeted exploring EDI issues within the business, took a junior cohort, paired up with board members. Uh, and that's, that's the most recent program mm -hmm. to complete, Emily, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we've used it in a number of different ways now. And I'd say it's, it's become part of the fabric of the business. So we thought we would share with you a kind of I suppose a practical insight into what the program looked like and, and what it was from having a formal structured program that supported the success of the program and delivered kind of organizational success. Um, and I'm going to show you in a second a, a, a kind of a map of the journey of, of what it looked like. Um, but I think the thing that I just want to highlight before I do that is that for every program of reverse mentoring, we ran it as in a, with cohorts. So it wasn't just that we paired people up, we matched them, um, and we did spend time thinking about the matching as well. Uh, we had calls with every individual um, and then matched based on what the mentee wanted to learn particularly, but also on kind of um, personality and experience, making sure that we were across difference. Um, but we wanted to make sure that the pairs not only had that experience of working with each other, but had the experience of being with a group of peers. So this was really important, particularly for the met, well, I say particularly for the mentors. Mark may have a different view as a mentee, but they were being asked as quite junior people within the organization to meet to create a relationship and to be a mentor to somebody really quite senior, a partner within a hierarchical structure. So it was quite a courageous um, step to take and we wanted them to be part of a peer group. So I think, how many, did we, how many pairs did we have in the first? Was it 11? Eight, eight, oh, eight. eight, it was eight. We had yeah. eight pairs. So we wanted to make sure that the eight mentors had chance to meet and share their experiences and learn from each other and support each other. And likewise for the mentees as well to think about what's this experience like for you? What are the kind of things that you're talking about with your mentor? What's the so what for us as partners in the Birmingham office? Um, we thought that there was a real benefit by having cohorts go through a program. And we started off with the pilot being a 12 month program um, with certain touch points through the 12 months. Uh, after the pilot, we tweaked it and it became a nine month program. And that's what I am going to show you here. So um, hopefully you can all see this from, from back there. But we started off, um, and I think Mark and I, in kind of autumn 2017, had a thought generation session. It was Mark, myself. Um, a colleague of mine and a colleague of Mark's, we all sat down and really thought about what's the purpose of this program? What do we want to be achieving? What will the success criteria look like? We had a look at all of those things. Who are the mentees going to be? Who do we want the mentors to be? We really got into the detail of it all um, and then moved on into the kind of matching process where internally Mark and it was Sally, wasn't it, who was working with us, um, kind of thought about who we wanted to have and then went out and recruited. Um, and then at the conversation space as externals, we had one-to-one -one calls with everybody. We kind of, we did the matching process and I think it was about three, it was about three months.
teaching at the very start, all of the mentors kind of together having a pastry and a coffee first thing in the morning. And I remember the mentees coming in, walk down the stairs. We were in an external um, space, walk down the stairs and the mentors kind of went, it was silent as, as you all walked in. And by the end of the day, it was such a different vibe. It, it really, um, we had worked hard to help integrate everybody and give people a chance to um, meet each other. So not only were the pairs meeting, but all across the mentees and the mentors, they had chance to work together and talk together and look at what is this and how do we make the most of it. So that was the program launch. The pairs then went off. We asked them to meet every month in various different ways to start growing their relationship. Um, at three months, we had a booster calls where we spoke mentees and mentors separately to check in, how are things going, more one-to-one -one meetings. And then at the midpoint, we had a session where we all came back together, um, had a half day together. Uh, more one-to-ones, and then we had a wrap-up. Uh, a final kind of celebration event to draw out the learnings, hear each other's stories and think about what if we were to do this again, what can you help us learn about? What's important for you? What was great? What wasn't so great? Before we then kind of moved on to phase two. So I'll hand back to Mark to kind of bring this to life from your own experience. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, I would say really keep key aspects of this whole process, the launch, the kickoff event, is a, such a crucial day when the, when the mentors and mentees meet for the first time and you have that, that initial pairing. Um, some of the exercises that the conversation space run in terms of stimulating that and getting that um, initial chemistry right to set the tone for the whole program is really important. And actually during the pandemic, we paused running reverse mentoring cohorts because we just didn't think it would work as effectively online. Uh, we, until we could do it again face to face, we stopped doing it. Um, and, and, I, and I still think that was the, the right thing to do because it is such a, such a crucial aspect of, of running these programs. The contracting as well on day one in terms of the commitments that the mentee and mentor make to each other, in terms of how they're going to run the relationship, how often they're going to meet, the importance of trust, and confidentiality in the, in, the, in the relationship, all of those top topics, aspects, a big part of that initial discussion uh, and really crucial, I think, for setting the foundations of making sure it's a success. I think along the journey, you know, the structure that's in place in terms of the, the booster calls and the midpoint review to make sure that the whole thing stays on track, that the mentors as a, as a group get to talk about issues they may be facing or things that are going well, things that m maybe could improve, and the mentees, they're important aspects of the program as well. And one thing that I would also say here, I think we, we did focus it very much on you know, being a firm of largely accountants and consultants. We did focus it on, you know, what tangible business outcomes have we got? What ideas here can we progress and take forward? It's great that we've had those individual conversations about the business and there's been a lot of learning at individual levels, but also what ideas have we got about really improving the business? And the, the things I was mentioning earlier, some of the examples of, of things that have come from, from the program. Thank you, Mark. So, hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight as to what it looked like, what it still looks like. Um, I know that RSM have got a new cohort, I think launching around April time um, of, of partners and people from across the whole of the national firm. Um, but I did want to just spend a moment before we finish talking about what um, we call brave space. So I think we've said here, creating brave space in conversation. Because there's something really important to say here around supporting two people to um, work in this way and to connect in this way. This is about, uh, it, this is about connecting across difference and learning across difference. And when we're asking people who are senior and experienced in their kind of in the path and in their career to step into a learning role with another person it's quite a mindset shift you know as we get more senior uh, we get used to being the one who has the answers or we feel we ought to anyway and what we were asking mark and his colleagues his peers to do was to be beginners again to come in with 
a, a really curious mindset and stay in that place of not knowing and really be able to listen and learn. And that's it's quite a shift. It's quite a challenging thing to do. We're also asking the mentors to speak their truth to power within the organization. So this is a vulnerable thing to do from both sides and a courageous thing to do from both sides. So there is a requirement to kind of shift from just understanding the need for psychological safety, you know, feeling as though we can make mistakes and that's going to be okay, into considering this isn't always going to feel safe and it's going to feel risky. It's going to be scary sometimes. We might be talking about things where I feel worried that I might say something that offends you. But if we are not able to do that, we don't really get to the heart and the juice of the matter. So to support the pairs to be able to do that, we really had to have some time separately with mentees and mentors to think about how do you stay in a beginner mindset? What happens if you find yourself switching back from the role of reverse mentee into being a mentor? You know, how are you going to support yourself to do that? How can you support each other to do that? And likewise, for the mentors, how are you going to, in the face of speaking to a powerful person, a partner within your office, who you, I'm sure, will be coming across in different contexts, how are you going to speak to them truthfully about the things that you see are not working culturally as well as the things that are working? So really having to think about how do we speak to my truth and how do I hear your truth as well? It, it, was, it was challenging and it still is. And it still is for all of us. But if we do want to be growing organizations where we can really be curious and really have conversations which change the way we do things, we have to be stepping into that brave space. So I think I'm going to stop there. Unless Mark... I, just very quickly, I think one of the biggest, maybe, issues that we had in the program, building on what Emily yeah. said, um, getting mentors and mentees to stay in role is really easy for that to flip over. And, and, and in practice, we did see some of that happen, you know, where mentors and mentees had to be, we had to use some of the interventions during the program to get the relationship back where we wanted it, rather than... You know, for some of the mentors, this was a great opportunity to speak to a senior person and take some advice and get some input. And, and so that was an easy, easy shift. So we had to work on that. Um, and to equalize the conversation, uh, one of the things that was really strongly encouraged by the conversation space is you know, don't, don't ever meet in the office. Find new places, find innovative places to, to speak and talk. Go on a walk, go to a park, go to a restaurant, go to wherever, but find a neutral space so that you can have that, that conversation open conversation away from the pressures of, uh, that might be, might be there at work. I'm going to stop now as well because I'm <laughs> conscious of the time. We've got a few minutes left for questions, I think. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I think there's a mic heading your way. Please tell us who you are. It would be nice to, nice to know. Um, I'm Jez K. Um, I'm a leadership consultant and um, fascinated in the... largely because I've got a daughter who's 22 years old. I'm fascinated in reverse mentoring because I've been reverse mentored many times. <laughs> um, you're an accountancy and a consultancy, and do you, do you feel that the nature, the culture, and particularly the culture, perhaps, and I'm assuming, and I apologize for assuming, of hierarchy and status yes. has changed as a result of this program? And how? Um. I certainly do, yeah. I think, um, I think that in what we've done with this program, it has opened up just new communication channels you know, and a perception of the partners in a different light. That I think, as, although you've only got a small number of mentors in the grand scheme of the size of the office, we have done it three times now, and we've tried in Birmingham, and we tried to build up you know, a broader cohort, and of course, of course some people leave, but we're trying to disseminate that through the business that the, the partnership is open to and listening to ideas and people that can then across the office can see across the locations can see tangible change as a result mm. 
So in our communications, you know, we've tried to reinforce that and demonstrate that actually, if you've got a great idea, there are ways of getting that progressed. And that's really what we wanted to share, that actually um, it's not about command and control and top down, and we're not interested in people lower down the organization and their ideas. And I, and I really think we have made progress on that, yeah. I would say, I'm just going to add to that. I would say that um, at the end of the pilot, the, the group of mentors talked about how differently they felt in their levels of confidence with speaking to any of the partners within the office, not just their reverse mentee. Um, it had really shifted mindset around that as well. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I'm going to come to you after. Hi, oh, sorry. Uh, Mark O'Connor, Ramble, which is an um, architecture and design firm. Um, We've, we've run um, reverse mentoring in the traditional um, way, as you said, in, in relation to age technology. This year, we're uh, rolling out reverse mentoring uh, in relation to some of our groups, such as um, uh, the racial quality group, uh, neurodiversity. Um, we also run a workshop around allyship and inclusion where we talk a lot about um, intersectionality and, you know, we're made up of many things. And then... We're then going into reverse mentoring where in some ways we are then singling out on one kind of particular characteristic. Yeah. I was just wondering from both your perspectives, um, any thoughts or advice that you would give as we step into that new part and how we manage those two almost slightly in conflict with each other? Yeah, it's a really... I don't know that I have enough time to give your question justice in my answer, but it, I would say it is, it's sensitive, it's sensitive territory. And um, what I have learned about it is that so long as we are transparent, so long as we involve the people that we want to be working with in the thinking about how we do this and what's going to be important to them, I'd say they're two really important things to begin with at the start um, I think I'm not sure if I'm going to get the terminology right here but um, proactive mm, I've, I've forgotten the terminology but I will find it for you but it, the importance of being upfront about why we're doing this and why we are working if you choose to work with the group of people who are neurodiverse you know it's not about so long as it's not kind of tick box and um, uh, you know, just doing it because we have to, but actually it's because we really do want to learn and this is what we're going to do as a result, then I think that's really key as well. Um, but yes, of course there's intersectionality, there is with all of us, um, you know, we all bring various different aspects of our identity and when we turn up in these conversations it's not just going to be about me as somebody who's neurodivergent or me as a white cisgender you know whatever it might be it's all of that because we are all of those things as humans um so i think that the more open you can be about that and the more curious you can stay about that as you set the program up i would say they're the they're the kind of start points for me i don't know if there's anything you would add there mark um Nothing, nothing specific to add to that. I was just conscious of the time. I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to get yeah. one more question, I know there was another hand. Wasn't there was there? another hand here. Yeah. Two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Okay. Two yeah. minutes. Hi, Janice Hello. from Burr Hill Group. Hi, Janice. Um, with the cohort of eight, did you advertise um, for mentors and mentees and have some kind of recruitment process where people could uh, self? identify and go through a process? Um, so, uh, with the first cohort of mentees, the, partners, the partner group in Birmingham at that stage was about 20. And if I'm honest, I chose people largely to give us a cross section of people, but also people that I thought would embrace it in the first instance to get us going. Over time, um, a lot of partners and directors have participated, but I took, took a bit of a low-hanging fruit approach um, because not everyone would have embraced it in the same way. But, but, it, but in doing that, also giving us a wide cross-section of the business across different service lines, across all the different characteristics of the partnership that we had. On the, um, for mentors, we did approach people. We, we again approached people that we thought would be would speak, 
would talk, would, would be the right kind of people in terms of, of, of sharing information, sharing knowledge from within the business. Um, and we approached people and said, would you like to be part of this program on the first instance? It's, it's opened up a little bit more widely since then, but that was, how we're, that was where we started from. Yeah. Thank you. I would say now it is open. Uh, it's, it, there's an open recruitment process and people apply and then there's a kind of uh, a selection and an interview and all the rest. But yeah, for the first one, we were thoughtful. Yeah. I think we're out of time. We're out of time. Thank yeah. you, everybody, so Thank much. Thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, good luck. <laughs>